just sort of to get ourselves oriented again, um, during what time span were you actually in Vietnam? Just rounded off to say 68 to 69. Okay. And then your original assignment in Vietnam was with what unit? 9th Division, 2nd uh, Brigade, 3rd Battalion, 60th Infantry, Alpha Company, 2nd Platoon. Right. So you were a platoon leader and you were down in the Mekong Delta and you were a riverine unit. That is, you had a base that was actually on board a ship. That's rather, correct. Rather than, so it's kind of an unusual situation. And we covered a lot of different dimensions of your activities um, with that unit. Um, and I guess one basic question I've got regarding that before we move on, and we probably covered it already last time, but I might want to make sure. Uh, overall, how would you sort of characterize the or, or evaluate the quality of the soldiers who were serving under you at that time? <coughs> My boys were, <coughs> were pretty good. Um, farm boys are a little bit better than city boys because they're more comfortable outdoors. Uh, if you made them comfortable, that you knew what you were doing, they would go along. I may have mentioned last time, there is, a, there is a point in time when things go bad rapidly and everyone turns and looks at you and I found myself looking at them like saying, what do I do now, Lieutenant? And then they, you say, my turn. Mm -hmm. Right. My turn. Right. And so you did that. They want you to on. do something. Mm -hmm. And if, if you do something at the right time for the right purpose, instinctively and based on training, they'll follow you because they're looking to somebody to follow. And once you set that model up, then whatever else you do thereafter, you're golden. Mm -hmm. And do you have any, uh, so you mentioned a little bit about sort of their backgrounds. You said you know, some are sort of Southerners, some are Northerners. Uh, do you have a sense of sort of what their backgrounds were or where they were from? The guys I traveled with in front, I always led from the front. And I did it for practical reasons, because under fire, it's too hard to come back from the rear. I had Baldo Morales from California, a Hispanic. I had a guy from Columbia who got drafted in the Army. I had Ralph Becker, a potato farmer from Idaho. I had a boy out of Saginaw named Knapp, who was at that time working in a pizza place. And these are just simple guys. Mm -hmm. They're thrown together from you know, different backgrounds, and they all coalesced during this period of time. And they're good. Mm -hmm. They're good. They put down fire. Right. Everybody doesn't fire in a firefight. But most people that I have, I believe, did. Mm -hmm. And I had a guy who was from, he was, <laughs> his mother was from Hong Kong, and his father was from Peru. So, you know, flip a coin. You know, I don't know where these guys come mm -hmm. from. That's it. All right. Uh, now, you basically, they move officers around a little bit. They don't, an uh, 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 enlisted man might be with the same company for his full tour if he stays healthy, yeah. but uh, officers get different assignments. So after you finished up your time with, as a platoon leader, what did you do after that? They pull, uh, generally, the, I wouldn't know if it's the policy, but they, they kept a platoon leader online for six months. Mm -hmm. Then. They pulled me up to be the assistant, the assistant, second brigade intelligence officer, which wouldn't have been, it's called an S2. And as they pulled me out of my line because of my ranger background and because of my infantry background, and, and to tell you the truth, most of the guys on the staff those were all infantry guys mm -hmm. anyway. You didn't have branch qualified guys. You just fell in. You right. just fill in uh, that job. And then I had to take the responsibility when we would have these alert patrols assigned to us, I'd find a slot for them. I'd find a mission that coordinated everybody, do the coordination, find the area to go to, insert them, extract them, keep in contact with them, set up my own combo shop, and then do the other intelligence jobs when I was not conducting these types of patrols. Mm -hmm. Now, how long did you supervise those patrols, do you think? You mean once they were out? No, I mean, in terms of as that, as your regular assignment of doing these, um, was that the rest of this, the other the second six months or just part of it? No, that was it. That was it. Oh, break, break. Mm -hmm. They pulled me out of that job, come to think of it. 
they started they had they brought in another another piece of equipment it was called a, it was a little radar set set up on a tripod and they said we want you to put together a team and set these things up throughout the province which was Kenwa province and everyone divvied up some poor smuck and usually the person that you divvied up was the person you wanted to get rid of. So they, br they bought them all together with me. Mm -hmm. And he said, make this happen. So we all went to this class and on these radars. And these were ground radars, ground reconnaissance radars. Mm -hmm. And then we had to uh, find a way to get them out in the field. Now, let me tell you, these weren't always the best, brightest guys. I had one guy who was part of McNamara's Project 100,000. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what politicians do and they don't have enough time. And these were people who were mentally dull. But tell you the truth, that doesn't mean the kid doesn't work. So you find a kid who's mentally dull, you give him a mentally dull position, and he'll do an outstanding job of it. So he had that job. And I put all these guys together, and these son of a guns came up, and they started constructing these towers. So we made towers that you could take in two swing shifts. I mean, a, a hop, chopper could take the base, mm -hmm. then they'll take the top, and these guys would put it together, and we'd go on these regional forces compounds with a couple of MACV guys, and we set these up. And I didn't do much of all. I just watched these guys go to work. And these guys were very clever at what they did. And one time, I, I, I questioned how clever because basically they were thieves. We said, how are we going to talk to these guys? Because I would take a team. Oh, there goes my microphone. I would take a team and put them out into these RFPF sites, regional forces, popular forces sites, mm -hmm. and they would tell them what's out there. I went on R&R &R to Hawaii. I came back. I had a Jeep. And on the back of the Jeep, there's a spare tire. And on top of the spare tire is my name with, with a symbol of a radar on it. And it says, OIC, officer in charge. I didn't own the Jeep. <laughs> but the Jeep also had a trailer. And then <clears throat> one day, this, my NCO came, E5, he said, we, got, we solved the problem with the camo. We have a 2.9 or 2 antenna set up. And I could talk to all my people. About three days later, and this captain comes around and he says, do you have a 292 antenna? And I says, uh, yeah. He said, well, we're missing one. And some of your boys were over there and said, is that our antenna? I said, no, no, we've had this thing for months. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when, we, when we came out, when, when, we, when they pulled us out of there, this is, you know, we pulled us back. I'm jumping ahead here try to turn this equipment in. And the guy said, I can't take this Jeep. It's not on my records. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't, get a, I couldn't get rid of some of this equipment because they said, I have nothing to match it up against. <clears throat> I'm not sure to this day where that Jeep went. <laughs> but it worked because if, if, uh, when we had these radar s systems set up, if they went down, we were 24-7 operation. We had to get another radar set out there, or batteries, because they all worked off battery mm -hmm. packs. And then when, in that base camp, we were charging the batteries. I make a phone call, came in, I tell them, I need a chopper, I got to get them out to this site. And off we went. That's why we needed the Jeep and the trailer, to get all this equipment out, the radar sites or the batteries. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes we take a mechanic out there, if radars need mechanics. But off we would go. And that's what we did for a living. So everything worked to the greater glory. All right. How well did the radar itself work? Was that a useful intelligence tool? Well, it was, it was testing. They still use them. I mean, they, they, you know, they've gone on. I don't think we blew a lot of people away. We did have fun with them sometimes. So sometimes I would go out to these uh, sites, mm -hmm. and I'd spend three, four days there to see how they're operating. And they would say, I, I got, you know, maybe three, four people 
500 yards out. I have an, I, we have an M79, you know, it's a grenade launcher. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I prop that baby up there with the sights, you know, and just a poom, send out, trying to launch him out there, see if anything moved out there. Mm -hmm. And we'd go out the next day and I couldn't see any signs of, you know, killing anybody. Mm -hmm. But I don't know they worked. Now, did you have problems with uh, sabotage or people trying to steal pieces out of them or anything like that? No. This, the radar set was probably no bigger than this. Mm -hmm. And with a little fan on it that would sweep. And then the guy would sit there and look at a screen, and he'd have ear things, too. Okay. And it would tell him that it, it, he could hear it auditorially, mm -hmm. and then he could see it visually, you know, and he put the two, the two together. Now, was the guy one of your unit, or was... Oh, it was one of our people. Okay, so, you, so it's not as if you plant these things out there somewhere, leave them unattended in the middle of somebody else's camp. They're, they're in a little compound, mm -hmm. very little compound. We're always with some Americans there, and we'll put our people in the ground. Mm -hmm. We put them up on these towers, and uh, we let it run. Mm -hmm. We didn't set them up at night, during the daytime. We always set them up at night. And you didn't just put them out in the, just out in the open someplace around the countryside and no. park them? Yeah. These were not trail cameras you would use to see if deer go by. Right. All right. Uh, now... I think that we had in the, in the previous interview, we, we had talked about your, your, your supervision of the long-range patrols and so forth. I think that was something that, that we had kind of gotten to. Um, now, let's going to go back to the, sort of the situation that you had in, in the brigade headquarters. Um, I think you had a, a, a brigadier there, a commander who was the brigade not commander. effectively. Yeah. Well, he was, you want me to talk about him? Yeah. I, I think he passed on... Uh, a very impressive looking man. Uh, but he, he was a very demanding man, but it made no sense. Here's how a normal schedule would, on that staff, we're on, this is on the ship, on the staff would be. He would come back from doing whatever he did during the day. And we would have us after evening show, have a staff meeting at seven. They would last two hours. Some of that time was ranting and raving by him. And then when he was done, say it's 10.30, 11 o'clock at night, then he would give out missions to accomplish. And then he would work on that, and you'd get ready for the morning brief, which was around 5.36. So you see how night's a little compressed mm -hmm. here. And then you would start your day off and run that normal cycle. And you go in that evening time, those evening briefings. So that was very tiresome. And then he started firing people. He had people so confused. What did he do at the time? That he had, he made his uh, EXO, Brigade EXO, so confused that he once <laughs> introduced the headquarters company commander as himself. So this is Lieutenant Colonel. <laughs> and then he gave his name, which caused a small pause. And he sent one, he fired him, fired the, uh, his deputy. Mm -hmm. Sent him out to the 4th Division. He was later killed. He was a good man. The only clever guy in the whole thing was the S-1. He was a major. He would have died a major. But this guy was writing so, so many bad OERs, officer efficiency reports, and he was so unstable during that period of time that if the S-1 didn't like the report, he'd change it. He said, this guy's an idiot. And it kind of was, because one time he, he told me to be in two different places simultaneously. And I repeated back the order, and I said, yes, sir, can do. And that was it. Mm -hmm. But he would change the writing on, the, on these reports to protect the other people. Mm -hmm. The only guy that came out of there that was, and most some of these guys were really good. 
is um, DS3, the operations officer, Major Morelli, who later, later I met a number of years later as Major General Morelli. Good man. Died of cancer way too early, but a good man. He was, he kept everything, I wouldn't say upbeat, but he put stability in it because mm -hmm. we knew there were sane people in the world. Uh, and it got to a point where his, he would have a dedicated chopper fly in, pick him up every day. And he got to the point where people were calling him sick as opposed to flying him. Now, that's an exception to the mm -hmm. rule. Most people are pretty doggone good and pretty conscientious. He was, he was literally an exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. um, he, is, uh, he had a guy in the headquarters, James Bates. He was a lieutenant. It's a true story. And Bates, <coughs> he wanted to know when some company was inserted. And Bates said, uh, he told Bates, tell me when Charlie Company gets inserted. This is a night operation. Mm -hmm. And then he, he came back and he said, Charlie Company has not been inserted. And he said, I know it, it, it has been inserted. He said, no, sir, it hasn't been inserted. He said, now go back and tell me when it was inserted. And Bates said, you know, I don't know what to do. It hasn't been inserted. And he came back and he said, no, sir, it had not been inserted. He said, you're lying. Get out of my talk, tactile operations center. And he turned to the brigade S1. I want that man in the field by morning. Bates, he didn't know jack squat about being in the field. So he came back, and I said, okay, I gave him all my do what did he's my gee gaws. I said, here, here, take my stuff. Mm -hmm. here's, here's my poncho. Here's my rucksack. Here's this. Here's how I use this. And he was in the field the next day. He had no idea what he was doing. And he was... Um, he was wounded two days later. He was totally a fish out of water. He mm -hmm. wasn't an infantry guy. And that was it. He also said he threw him a water jug at him. And then he, that brigade commander did not last that long, but there was something terribly wrong with him. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is something like a catch-22. Yeah. But you do find people like that. Mm -hmm. Now, did he leave after you did, or did he leave while you were still there? Well, he left when I was still there. Okay. Uh, and then what sort of character did you get for a replacement? I have no idea. Or did you not even? Was. Okay. That was near the end of the time. Mm -hmm. Then we started to see what they started to do is pull back. Mm -hmm. um, Nixon was going to pull some units back, the first withdrawal out of Vietnam, and we were selected for that. Um, the unit was selected. But they took people from the, basically, they took people from the division and just mm -hmm. filled up a unit and sent us back. Mm -hmm. So you were part of that unit? Yes. Then that, that's going back. Okay. Yeah. And so they, they, they take you back. Now, were you on ship at that point or on aircraft or? No, they pulled us, uh, they pulled us off the ship and he moved us into our Dongtan base camp mm -hmm. where we practiced out of March because they were going to take us back to Seattle. They flew us out as a group. Mm -hmm. And then we did have to march. And looked pretty doggone good through downtown Seattle. But they all give us new uniforms mm -hmm. and new boots, so we look nice. We did a good job, and we wanted to. Mm -hmm. You know, we're marching in front of the home folks. Okay. And now when was that? Was that 69 now? 69. Okay. And anything interesting happened on that march or after it? Um, because you got an active peace movement by then. Oh, yeah. Uh, the hippies... Uh, um, the Pinko Kami hippies were there. They made a mis <coughs> they misjudged the tenor of the boys. When we, we marched in, because we, break, break, let me go back one. Mm -hmm. We were living at Fort Lewis, mm -hmm. which is just, just down the road from Seattle. Yeah. So they put us all in buses. So, you know, you move, a, you move 500 people, it takes a little organization. After we marched through, they put us all back in buses again. Now, there's a, sh <coughs> the, the time, because of space travel, 
error. The time when you're in country and the time where you're in the United States can be compressed. Mm -hmm. So all the guys are, all these buses are in a row here. And then the, the peace movement keeps trying to shove in, um, uh, make love, uh, not war, um, stuff into and then through the windows. I pity that. You know, I'm going to watch my language here. You need son, you know, you need son of a bitch who comes around with me with a VC flag at this time is going to get a guttural, emotional, non-cognitive reaction. Mm -hmm. And that happened. A guy tried to walk into our bus with a VC flag. And that man left that bus at the base of my toe, standing at the top of that stairs, and trying to walk in there. That I'm gonna, that's not going to go. You got, you got two emotions, too much emotion here. And then the buses started to take off, and people started, because you know, we had the windows open on the side. I don't know why, but it doesn't matter. Shoving stuff into there. And the troops started grabbing a hold of these arms as the buses started to take off. They started dragging away because, you know, you got, you got these guys, I don't care what their religious, political, mm -hmm. country of origin point is, they're still a little uptight. And I just have to say, hey, you got to let go of those guys mm -hmm. because, you, you know, somebody can get seriously hurt, like the gentleman who just tried to walk into this bus with a VC flag. Uh, that happened to me again in Maryland. And I think there's where, if there's a, uh, a conflict between the war, peace movement and the uh, VC war movement, which sometimes I'm having a hard time separating, is it is very difficult to say, if I saw some Nguyen carrying a weapon, carrying a VC flag, 30 days ago, I popped them. Now I see some New Yen or American carrying a VC flag down my street. I can't pop them. Exactly how does this work? He's an enemy there, but he's a peaceful demonstrator here. So that's, that was always a conflict to me. Still is. Mm -hmm. All right. Once you... They brought you back to the States. Now, you're, most of the men who are coming back with you, their enlistments are going to be about Correct. up. They go back to civilian life. <laughs> now, but you're, you've kind of gone career military at this point, so what do you do next after you get back to the States from Vietnam? We all broke up and went to the Seattle airport. Mm -hmm. And we were... There must have been 15 to 18 of us. And we sat in this bar in the SeaTac airport, and they had tables in there. And we formed a blockade. It's a neat story, because it was cool. I mean, this was, and we formed a blockade, and we made our own little compound. Mm -hmm. And we just sat there, because we knew we we're just all going to split up four ways. The series is over. Mm -hmm. We lost, not individually, but the country declared, mm -hmm. whatever declared. And we get civilians coming over. We say, hey, how, you know, what are you guys doing, you know? And we say, oh, you know, we just came back, you know. And, and people wanted to join us. And we wouldn't let them. We formed our own blockade. Mm -hmm. Get away from us. You were so curious, you should have joined up. You're that, you were that interested, you know? Go make your money. Go, go, whatever you guys do. You got a right to do what you're doing. We won't bother you. You don't bother us. It's two separate societies going on simultaneously. And neither one sees eye to eye at this point in time. But this was our time. Mm -hmm. And then <coughs> I catch a plane and go home. I don't tell anybody I'm coming home. Because I don't want to 
I don't tell anybody when I'm leaving. I, it's my own, I just go. Like when I left, mm -hmm. I took the car, I drove to the airport, gave my wife another set of keys, got on a plane and left. I come home, sometimes you go, first thing you do is you hope that someone's home and no one was home. So I sat there with my uniform on, pulled up a chair. It was hot in Georgia. Took my shoes off, put my foot, feet in the pool, and waited for my wife to come back. So surprise, surprise. That's just how I am. The next thing I did is this. Before I left, there's a piece of loose molding by the door. I pounded a nail halfway in that molding. And I said, in one year, ooh, these emotions come. And one year I'll come back and finish the job. And he came back in and pounded that nail in. Mm -hmm. Which something should he be out of the movies. But that was true. That's, I mean, you do that for the family, too. Mm -hmm. Because that, where we were living, it was not unusual to see an army car go by and it was going to somebody's house. And the women were going nuts because sometimes they slow down in front of your house mm -hmm. to see an address. And then when I was home, my wife got the telephone call. It said, we're sorry to report that your husband's been killed in action. And that was not from the Army. It's from those peace-loving. Oh, Lord. Yeah, well, that was a typical, that was not unusual. You know, I hadn't heard that one before, but that's awful. Yeah, and she said, that's unusual because he's sleeping in the bed right now. Uh, but that was not unusual. Okay. Uh, now, what was your next assignment then? I was assigned to, uh, <coughs> I was assigned to the Ranger Department, which is, <coughs> excuse me, um, the Ranger Department runs three training bases, one at Fort Benning, one in the mountains in Dahlonega, Georgia, at that time one in Florida, mm -hmm. which still go on now. And uh, that's the three phases, basic phases of, of Ranger School. And then they, they come up with the POIs, Program of mm -hmm. Instruction, and they, they coordinate everything. And they said, hey, uh, you're welcome to the Ranger Department. Uh, go over here and see your boss. And he was still a good friend today. And my boss happened to be as same day, same month, same year birthday as I am. And the first day he was going to fire me. And I'll tell you why. Because we had to set up these ropes. We were doing a rappelling class. And I got there early. So I just went and got all the ropes. And I started hooking up the ropes, and he was mad as I had her because I hadn't report to work yet. Because he told me, okay, this would be here tomorrow, this place, this time, get this stuff. I just came early. Well, he didn't see my car, so he didn't think I, was show, I showed up. And then later on, I'm already setting this stuff up for him, and he said, great initiative, Lieutenant. And that's how that story went. That's a stupid story. I don't even know why I threw it in there. But... Uh, he was a good man. Yeah. Uh, which, which of the uh, ranger places were you? Were you at Dahlonega or were you at Benning? Or? I, was in, I was in Dahlonega as an enlisted man right. in 62, right, 63. Right, we've covered that before already. But I'm now in Benning. Okay, now you're Benning. Okay. And then uh, I'm teaching, uh, I'm, I'm walking lanes. A lane instructor is a guy who goes, takes a, these guys out and grades them on their actions. And sometimes you may have, uh, each student is usually broken down. One would do the order. He has to write the order and give it. Then the guy, next guy takes order. But you don't know what, it, what your job's going to be. You know, I mean, I would mm -hmm. know which student is going to get which part. And then that's what I did. And then you write these guys up. And then you write them up. And then... If it's rainy and it's cold, you're rainy and cold. 
you're just like the student. You're mm. another smuck, you know. You don't you just you lay in there all night long in the rain or you lay all night long in comfortable surroundings. But you're a demagogue at this time. I mean, you are the man. Mm -hmm. But you can't show any favoritism. I mean, you just don't talk to these students. You're just there to observe. You do nothing to interface, to hint, anything. Now, were these people who were officers or officer candidates, or were they from all ranks? <coughs> okay, both. Now, I'm going to have to tell you everything. Ranger Department had one series of late instructors for the Ranger students who were in the nine, the two and a half month course. Mm -hmm. And he had an OCS program down there which would last. We had them for two weeks. So I would work on the OCS with the students there. Mm -hmm. And then they would have the shake and bakes, the NCOs, the top dogs of the basic training in AIT. Mm -hmm. If they did well, they could go to, they could make an E5. Yep. And if they did really well, I think some of them top of the class can come out to be E6. So you had the training phase for those guys. Mm -hmm. These are abbreviated courses. Right. These are leadership courses. I was involved more with the OCS guys and the shake and bakes. And that's a pejorative term, and it shouldn't be. But basically, it's two. Mm -hmm. And then we take them out. Train them, and then we take them out to the woods for a week, and we we'd spend a week a week in the woods with them. You know, we're camping with your army buddies, and we were out in general equipment in Whitman counties, in Georgia. Now, how long did you do this job? About a year, I think. And the reason I moved is because the army at the time of commissioning. If you're a regular Army officer, which I was, you would serve two years in a combat arms, armor, artillery, infantry. And then you could go, if you chose not to be one of those three, then you would go into the specialty that was, that your, was your choice. Mm -hmm. And my choice at that time was intelligence. So I had served my two years. And then he said, OK, we're going to go now, Slick. Well, I'm going to go be an intelligence officer. Well, what are you going to do? I don't know. So how are you going to find this out? I don't know. So they, they sent me to intelligence uh, branch selection guys in Washington, D.C. And they said, what can we do for you? I said, I'm supposed to be an intelligence officer, and I don't know what to do. He says, let me, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. What can I do? So. We did a circular conversation for a while. And he said, I think you should do this. And I said, OK, I'll do it. Have I, have I gone through this with you yet? No, oh, no, this, not is. this part. No, we had your earlier stuff oh. before. But he said, uh, you're going you're gonna to need some language training. I said, uh, cool. He said, uh, I want to send you to German language school. I said, OK, when do I go? Oh, you can't. you got to have a. I don't know if you have an aptitude for language yet. Aptitude? He said, are you good in math? I said, no, I'm terrible. I'm a disgrace in math. He said, hmm, that's going to be bad. He said, well, go back down to Fort Benning, take a German aptitude test. Take an aptitude test for languages. Mm -hmm. So I went to this, I went, out, I made, went to the testing center. All these places have testing centers. He said, I'm supposed to take an aptitude test for language. And he said, what do I need to, to pass it? And he said, well, we like guys 60, 70, but the lowest minimum is 40. And I said, I don't know what kind of test is it. He said, I can't tell you. But sit down, take this test. What it is, it's a made-up language. And you have to look at this sentence, which is a made-up language, and pick out like a verb or something. It made no sense to me. It's like Esperanto. I might have been, could have been an Esperanto. Could have been a Pig Latin. I don't know. <laughs> well, get done with it. And I said, there it is. And he says, well, I said, I'll grade it for you. Then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to send it in officially. And he said, 
you have an eight. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I, I don't recall an eight on a test before. He says, like, I, I don't think you're going to go to language school. I went back to Washington. I said, yeah, you, got a, you got an eight, Slick. And he said, I really can't send you. I said, you know what, I'm not bright, but I'm pretty disciplined. You send me, I will learn that language. He sent me, and I learned that language. I didn't learn the language, I memorized it. I had no idea if my predicate adjectives corresponded with my dangly modifiers, but I memorized it. I worked four times as hard as anybody else in that class. And they had some guys that didn't do anything, mm -hmm. and they got it, you know? You know, there are people who are polyglots, and they, you know, they just run with it. Mm -hmm. Not me. I worked my butt off. Still did. Still do now and then try to try to stay up with it. And I don't, I don't speak German anymore because there's no one to speak German to. But I mean, I really, it, it paid off because after I lived eight years in Germany, so it was, it was quite beneficial. Mm -hmm. But I thank that man. And here's a little bit of history for you. His grandfather, the man who allowed me to go, mm -hmm. his name was Tom Ferguson, and I thanked him numerous times. Because after a while, you start, you get into these interlocking circles with right. people, and you, you know, you cross. His grandfather, on his mother's side, was Ned Allman. Ned Allman was MacArthur's G2 and commander of the 8th Army in the Korean War. I think he was 10th Corps commander. That's right. Yeah. 10th Corps commander. Yeah. But he was also uh, MacArthur's right. G2. Yeah, he was one of MacArthur's guys, yeah. At least he made himself one. He had been in European theater in World War yeah. II. I, I yeah. lost, that's all I knew about him. I thought that was kind of neat. Yeah. You know, he said that was my grandfather. All right. Now, once you got the language training, what did they do with you? Send me to Munich. Okay. Now, did you take your family with you at that point? Yes. Sure did. All right. Uh, now, what kind of assignment did you have out there? Business. Business. You keep nodding your head, and I keep saying business. The special intelligence collection, that would require the use of German for collecting intelligence from human sources. Mm -hmm. Punt. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's the sort of thing where, with, with that kind of thing, you know, you welcome to sort of, you can explain as much about what you did as is appropriate for you to explain. I don't know well, what you figure is, is still classified there or not, but. Sensitive uh, methods and procedures. Well, were you dealing with. I traveled around a lot, mm -hmm. Bavaria, meeting, meeting people discussing possible business opportunities with them, mm -hmm. where only one side was knowledgeable for a period of time about what those possibilities could be. It's most interesting. Saw a lot of Germany. Saw a lot of castles. Mm -hmm. Saw a lot of interesting things. Okay. During what time frame were you over there? 73, 71, 73. Mm -hmm which was an interesting time in, in, in the world still in a lot of places. Wow. Now, were you still there at the time of the Arab-Israeli War in 73, or had you gone home by then? Because that's October, I think. Let me see, they had a one in 67. Yeah, 67 was Was one. this the Yom Kippur War? Yom Kippur War is 73, yeah. Um, I didn't get back to August, so I think that war was already that, going that on. That war was, Octo was October. Okay. Yeah, so you, you missed that one. I missed that one. But there was still a lot of issues in, in the Middle East as well as in, in Europe. I did go to Greece mm -hmm. when I was in Europe on a motorcycle. Great trip. I did a lot of trips on motorcycles back then. Uh, went to Rhodes, Crete, and traveled throughout Greece. Came back up to Italy, back into Germany, all mm -hmm. through Austria. Great trip. Great trip. People should do that more often and live. It's, you know, Good weather, a fantastic time. Mm -hmm. You know, I ran a 100-yard dash 
at the Olympics, the original. Beat the guy I was with. He's slow in Air Force in a way. <laughs> Still this slow, to tell you the truth. But we ran it. We ran it. We just got on the starting line and ran it. No one was there. This is the Olympics. No one mm -hmm. is there. The original Olympics. Right. We walked through the arch. There's a marble start line. It's flat. Built up banks, you know. Men didn't even wear any clothes in those things. Mm -hmm. I don't understand this. But I mean, man, that's like running in history. You know what I mean? It goes, I always found out that I love saying this because it's so true. And if you're least bit romantic or has some imagination, because no two people can occupy the same space at the same time. You can occupy the same space at a different time. And I like to occupy the same space at a different time. And since you're an historian, you know, you can kind of grasp, you know, when, you know, like me and there, my, a lot of people have done it. You can stand in the Nuremberg rally, you can stand exactly the same place mm -hmm. where Hitler stood and gave all those speeches. You can stand at the same place. Mm -hmm. And then you let your mind wander. Okay. A uh, little broader question about this time when you're here in, in Germany. Okay, so one of the things that's going on, kind of 71 to 73, is uh, Nixon's round of, of detente. I mean, you're getting. Nixon goes to China in, in 71. There are negotiations with the Soviets and things. Was there any sense in your area no. that the Cold War was changing at all, no. or was it just pretty much the same business no. as usual? Uh, <coughs> one, where we were, we had no US TV media. Mm -hmm. We just had radio. Our world was contained in our job and your sense, your, your immediacy, whether Nixon's playing ping pong with the Chinese mm -hmm. in whatever, the 70s, you are, excuse me, you're 100 miles from Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. um, there are these flare ups, you know, periodically. So you're, you, you view the world differently than uh, I think people in the States. In the mm -hmm. States, you've got two oceans, mm -hmm. and they don't have missiles. What do I care about the Chinese? But when you're closer, your world is more condensed when you're closer to your a potential enemy mm -hmm. than it is saying, but uh, too bad about the Chinese. Well, what time the tiger's on today? Mm -hmm. You don't care about that stuff. Yeah. You concentrate. OK. All right. So you do that two years. Uh, what comes next? Three. Oh, it was three years? Okay. And three years. I uh, left other in 74. They sent me to the nine-month of intelligence officer's advanced course at Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Mm -hmm. That's nine months, eight to four, do a paper, do two papers, do a major presentation, uh, read a lot of books, do a lot of things, take tests, mm -hmm. you're done. All right. Then I, then I took a company, then I re I was a company commander after that. And what company or what kind of company and where? Charlie Company, Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Since these were all students, it was a training company. Okay. I'd get these kids in, and they would go to class. And I, I'm, a, I'm a dorm master. That's what I do. I'm a dorm master. Mm -hmm. Make sure they fall out the formation, get them to class, get them back, get them fed and ferret out the losers and get them out of the army. That mm -hmm. was my job. Now, were these people who were all officer candidates? No, no, these were just, just Joe Smokey. Um, these, are, these are the first assignments. This is a skill set for their MOS, military mm -hmm. occupation specialty. OK. Because everyone goes to the generic basic training. Mm -hmm. right. After that, then they go into some kind of course that provides them some viability to the military. OK. Now, but was this MOS going to be intelligence then, because you're at Huachuca, or was this something else? Um, both, yes to both questions. Yes, it's going to be intelligence, because part of the students went through a course dealing with, they're all broken down. Some of these guys were going to be maintenance men for the radars that I talked about mm -hmm. in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. These were, the MOS was 17 kilo. That was the MOS. And some of these guys were mechanics mm -hmm. who, were, who would be the technicians. But 
They weren't intelligence guys, but they were at the school to become right. technicians because it, they get wrapped into the signal business. Right. But there's the, there's the radar, so that's where mm -hmm. they learned. The operators were 17 kilos. 17 kilos was an MOS, which if you flunked out of every other school, you went to this school. You just sat there and said, doo, doo, doo. yep, I hear something, I see something. Some were good guys. Most of them were low speed, low speed, high drag people. Mm -hmm. But again, everyone doesn't have to be brilliant. And you can serve a good purpose for overall. You don't have to be smart, but you gotta be good at what you do. And if that doesn't require a lot of ingenuity, be good at what you do. And that some of these guys, it was a perfect fit. Mm -hmm. And they provided a service. You know, down the road, you know, they saw something, they provided a service. But of course, some were just bums. So, they had a real neat discharge program, 635-1. You can throw out anybody for calls less than six months. They are 635-1 uh, discharge. Now, this is also a period here, you're getting far enough in the 70s, you've now got an all-volunteer army in place. Uh, and going into the service was not necessarily a terribly popular choice. You're right. Uh, so was the quality of personnel no. that you were looking at much different from no. the head? No. No, well, yeah. Well, maybe I misunderstood your question. Maybe well, I got ahead of myself. Well, I was asking, so you kind of compared to, say, the guys that you had serving with you in Vietnam, uh, <laughs> were these people No, they the weren't as level? good. No. Let me, let me go back to some facts about Vietnam. Okay. Most guys in Vietnam who were killed were white. Most guys were 19, and most guys were volunteers. Look it up on your Blackberry. You, you'll find that's true. That's how statistically it breaks down. They were not all draftees. Mm -hmm. So the, the, here's, you have a core you're within man. I'm going to philosophize, okay. and this is your dime. Yep. Within man, <clears throat> I think within males, you have, you know, your testosterone, stuff like this. There's this curiosity. Am I going to be a warrior or not? And some of these guys who join want to ferret this out of their own system. They want to go where this action is. They also feel a need to support their country. They feel a calling. So they go, specifically to go to Vietnam. Others are afraid to. So they join the reserves or National Guard or seek a deferment. It has been my experience that a lot of those people who get their deferment to run into the Guard or Reserve during an active war, do it because they're afraid. But they cover it with, I have, I have philosophical objections to war. Screw that philosophical stuff. Well, you, you, you either go or you don't go. It's been my experience that people over a period of time, and this has happened, where people came to me and said, I didn't have the guts to go, so I joined the reserves. What they're, what they're telling me, and I said, that's fine, I under, you know, what they're, what they're telling me is they carry the sense of guilt. Mm -hmm. and they carry it with them all the time. The only thing that good that comes out of wars, if you fought one, is that you get a sense of how will I, it answers the question, how will I respond when? Okay. And man has been trying to figure this out since the day he was born. Now, where do you put the draftees in that scheme? Because they go. They're fine. They they're, no, they're, no, my point on, on statistical breakdown versus uh, common, mm -hmm. you know, it's common knowledge that everybody who went to Vietnam was a draftee. Well, it's not. It's well, in, in the, the draftees are no different. The stereotypes are that it's the draftees' war, that it's a poor man's war that the people particularly in the line units are going to be the ones with the least education, fewest connections and no. so forth and that kind of thing. Um, 
and also that you've got a disproportionate number of, of minorities out there, especially blacks. No, I don't, that's not, I mean, I, I can, I speak from my world. That was certainly not the case. And when you're in a line unit and you're in the field, you don't have blacks and you don't have whites and you don't have Hispanics. You got your boys mm -hmm. and you don't, it's them boys. And you go to, you go with them. Mm -hmm. and there is none of this other stuff. You take it all back, you want to separate it, fine. But the boys are good, and they're draftees, they're all, they're all the same training. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to get out of there alive. And it has been my experience, you, you train people, you give them the sense that the more, <laughs> it's gonna sound bizarre to the average person, if you get in a fight, you kill as many of them as you can. Because, and you don't let anybody go. Don't let them, because if you run across three guys and you two guys get hit and one guy gets away, I told before, you got 18 guys. You're by yourself. There is nobody around you for a number of grid squares. You can't afford to let people get away mm -hmm. because it's you. It, we, in, and that may be hard for some people to comprehend, even being with 18 guys in the middle of an area that is considered contested or enemy terrain. And you get a phone call, I mean, not a phone call, you get, we get a call on the radio and said, we got a report to 300 man main force unit coming into your location. Well, I'm still here. I'm not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. These are the little things that trigger you. But you, you, you teach them to be aggressive. And there's no philosophy. That's why it's business. Mm -hmm. but all, and that's been business since the first, first guy threw a rock at the other guy and said, if I can hurt him, keep him away from me by a rock. If I throw it, it's easier than hitting him with a club. All right. Now let's wind ourselves back here to uh, training people out at Fort Huachuca there in mid to late 70s. Okay. Uh, did you have any understanding of why people at that time were enlisting in the military? Because they didn't have other options, or do you still have a fair number who do it because they? There's always there's always a fair number. Um, you would go. The army draws heavily from the south because that's where all of our bases are. Mm -hmm. Uh, because you can train here around there. The South has always had a history dating back to the Scott Irish. Mm -hmm. That's just goes back. You know, okay. these are the people who fought a revolution. These are p people who fought for the Confederacy. These are simple guys, one mule, two kids, a log cabin, and a wife up in the hills who gets taken up in all this. So you have tradition. Mm -hmm. And then in some cases you have a whole tradition where my father's father, 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 and it kind of, it, it's a, maybe an expected that the child is going to serve. Mm -hmm. uh, other, you get, because people want to do something different. They, they, they just want to do something different. Mm -hmm. And as time has progressed, I'm about to make a social commentary here, and I have no merit to make it. As time has progressed, people join to get out of what they see as a chaotic, unstructured civilian society that's concerned about the market, the price of gold, and they wanted to get into a more basic uh, serving society. The military is a serving society. Your part, your job is to serve. That's all you do. So your higher goal, the more you can serve, the more merit you get. And sometimes in civilian society, the more you can achieve materially, the greater your hero status is. Uh, that's when the guys get really filthy rich. They turn around and become servers again mm -hmm. by giving other money away. You need both societies, mm -hmm. you know. Before I get into the wolves, werewolves, and sheep, Sanaga. <laughs> Are you familiar with that one? Okay, but I won't get into that. All right. Okay, let's go kind of try to uh, trace out a little bit more uh, your military career here. 
Uh, so when were you then based uh, in Wachuca doing training? Um, I came out of that company command in 76. Then I went to a six-month counterintelligence course. Then I served on the staff there at the school teaching. Now, is this all still at Wachuca? Or? Well, Wachuca. I'm still at Wachuca. Okay. I'll stay in Wachuca until... And then I went to his uh, organizational development course at Fort Ord for four months. And of course, like 10 hours a day. Then he sent me back to Wachuca because they're the, one, they're the ones that sent me there. Mm -hmm. And I organizationally developed them because that was my job. So what does that actually mean, anyway? Organizational development. It means that <coughs> if, I, if I came to your history, you have a history professor, you have a history department, mm -hmm. and I would ask you some questions, because you had an interest. You had an interest in your section. And if you have an interest, you have things that you like in an interest and things that you don't like and you want to fix. Mm -hmm. So I become a, a consultant to you. And I have different tools which I can address your concerns. And there's a lot of uh, sensing sessions back then, um, approach, uh, things I can do to get feedback from your people. And then I can say, okay, this is what I think. This is what I know, and what do you want to do about it? And you say, I'll accept this, I'll accept this, I don't want to accept, that's tough. I'm not changing this, and I'm not changing that. So let's work on these two things to see if we can come up with a solution. <laughs> and one thing I learned from all that is when you're talking with people, negative always comes before positive. You ask them how they're, how they're doing today, how they like their job, They'll tell you everything they don't like about it first because they think you're a willing listener. And then you dump all that and you say, what do you like about it? And then you run on the positive. And that's what you do. You're, you're a consultant. Mm -hmm. They sent me to a consultant school. I got, okay. that, that school got me nine master credit hours from Pepperdine University in management. They call it organizational development. Mm -hmm. The Army called it, at that time, organizational effectiveness. It was a great, great school. Mm -hmm. It really was. And they brought in academics and a lot of practical exercises. And uh, we actually earned our money while we were there, overlooking uh, Carmel and, and that area. It was nice. Mm -hmm. It was mellow at the time. Nice bear. A nice pair of bell-bottom pants. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a good school. It was an excellent school. All right. Uh, now, then, does this start to be more of what you do? Than okay, I'm done. I'm, I'm done. That was my last job in uh, Fort Huachuca. Okay. It is now 1978. What happens? My, the, my masters call me up and say, I got a deal for you. And I say, What? And they say, you're going to go to the range every time and be the rest, too. I said, ah, I'd love to, love mm -hmm. to. I'd, I haven't been to airborne school yet. They said, no problem. What time is it now? What is it, Arizona time? <laughs> and I said, no. I said, okay, next week you're going to jump school. I got a slot for you. And they said, hey, that's great. I said, ah, oh, crap. I don't want to go. To, I'm not, I, I don't like heights. Uh, but off I went. I drove to Fort Benning, went to jump school, mm -hmm. came back, packed up, went to Fort Lewis. They said, welcome to the second range of battalion. I'm back in Seattle, Fort Lewis, to be mm -hmm. specific. And I served with them from, I, I forget actually, I think January of 78 till July of 79. Okay. And then great people. All volunteers. Only two range of battalions in the Army at the time. Mm -hmm. East Coast, West Coast. One's up, one's training. One's on standby to go. Uh, one's not on standby to go. Everybody goes on leave at the same time. Um, 
And people don't, officers included. I mean, if the battalion commander had absolute power, was like a ship's captain, you're gone the next day. We call it the Black Chinook. You come in in the morning and say, some guy will say, the Black Chinook. I say, oh, God, mm -hmm. that's a big yep. The Black Chinook came in last night. Uh -huh. For whom the bell tolls. I said, who was on it? Uh, Captain so and so is gone. And gone. Never to return. You never see the guy. He's gone. Mm -hmm. Oh, but super people, smart yeah. people. Now, did you ever go on alert during that time? Oh, we always went on alert. We, we would always, we were on alert for, we never deployed, mm -hmm. but we were on alert. We were, we were involved in this thing in uh, Zaire, and uh, some deal of French were mocking about. Uh, those, Congo, was it? Well, they were Congo or Central Africa, what was at some point the Central African Republic. There were a number of different African countries where the French, or for that matter, the Belgians were going and sending in regular troops to try to meddle in we civil were, wars. When, we're, when we were up, we had these EGs, emergency deployment readiness exercises. Because we had to deploy on three different schedules. I think we had two hours an out schedule, a six hour schedule, and maybe an eight hour schedule. Which meant you're now we're prepared to deploy in two hours. So we had a bay for two hours. So everybody went. That battalion was cleared up. 500 to 600 people on a plane flying somewhere mm -hmm. for two hours. That means buses had to be brought in or trucked. You had an A bay, two B bays. The staff went first. Battalion commander, S two S three. They take up maybe get a bit together like a Lear jet or something, mm -hmm. and we boom, we fly out. Uh, and we find out what's going on when they took us. We didn't know where we were going. Mm -hmm. You know, we were you're going to Timbuktu. We go, we go to sometimes Hawaii. We go to Georgia which is a long flight from Washington yep. State. Most often we get when we're always in the morning, you know, typical. It's got to be when you're sleeping. We go down headquarters for a little bit. They give you the, they give you the scenario. They give you the intelligence. In the meantime, everybody's packing up. I'd have my own, my people are doing their job, which one, Take all the things, uh, the microphones out, telephone. Two, stand guard everywhere. Three, people park their cars in a, in a, in a separate parking area and bob wire around it. Uh, four, uh, no cell phone, they have cell phones. Mm -hmm. But no, no means of communication now. Five, keep reporters away. Mm -hmm. Send them down to ask your questions to somebody else. Okay. Now, this is also the period when you're getting trouble in Iran. That's when the Shah gets he gets kicked out around then, and we eventually get into the hostage crisis and all of that kind of yeah. stuff. Now, yeah, just after I left, okay. 78 or 79. 79, yeah. Yeah, I got a phone call. I was, they sent me to the inspector general. I was the inspector general. I wasn't the inspector mm -hmm. general. From Wayne A. Downing, who died a couple of years ago, but he was a fourth star general at a SOCOM. He said, Dennis, John Downing, yes, sir. You ready to go before the show went down? He said, You want to go to Iran? Okay. Okay. Very down. I'll be in touch. And then things happened to that. It's another background stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll get to okay, um, but basically, we'll, we'll talk about uh, going into the Inspector General's office then. Uh, well, they just said, okay, I was up. Yep. My body was beaten and bruised, and I feel I meant I could have stayed on. I, I was very close to General Donnelly. He was Lieutenant Colonel at the time. I said, sir, I can't switch my allegiances. When you go, I go. 
so my my buddy took over my job, and Bill Powell took over from uh, General Wayne Dodd. And uh, Powell's a great man. I mean, all these guys are really super good people. And then Powell died about uh, six months later in a C-130 crash with a lot of the staff. And the nighttime, it was an airfield takedown, and they're flying into Nevada. Pilots had NVGs, uh, night vision goggles. Mm -hmm. They weren't good at them. They took the whole plane down, fully loaded, jeeps, gun jeeps, ammo. <laughs> they dropped that C-130 in the desert, about a mile off the runway. They caught fire, killed everybody. There's some good men, but the military, you lose people. Mm -hmm. But you lose people in car accidents. Yeah. Then he goes down a little more sensational, a little more violent. Okay. But now as for you, can I talk about your next assignment? Okay, on um, IG, mm -hmm. after that. Uh, so what do you do when the... What does an IG do? Yeah. Oh, two, two, two phases. The Inspector General does investigations monitors the health and welfare of the organization or the division. He's this I work for a division commander. And make sure that everything's running up the hall. And the troops are not taking advantage of it. It's an outlet, an outlet for soldiers. Mm -hmm. So we will do investigations. He said, I think something's wrong. I want you to investigate to see if there's a smoking gun. They'll do inspections, which are annual, and they're, they're in advance, where a unit is going to be inspected on all phases of its accountability, its efficiency, cleanliness, crime prevention, mm -hmm. you name it. And that goes on for about three days, and the whole team of inspectors will come in. Mm -hmm. They'll go over everything, the personnel records, the arms rooms, so much and so on. And I'm, sometimes I'm part of it. So when I'm not doing all this stuff, some guy from some unit will call up and say, I want an appointment with the inspector general. Secretary says, OK, come on in. And he shows up at your office. Secretary says, PFC Smidlap is here. He says, I'm down. OK, Smidlap, sit down. What's on your mind? Well, I think, I think my sergeant is too hard on me. OK, why is that now, Smidlap? Well, three bags full. Okay, you read it all up. What do you want me to do, Smith Lab? I want you to make him stop. I'll say, well, let me talk to your NCOIC. Smith Lab, go back to your duty station. And by the way, does your sergeant know where you are? No, I didn't tell him. So you're missing from your duty station, correct? I said, well, maybe Smith Lab, that's part of your problem. So I'm going to call up your sergeant and tell him you were here on, on the way back. And then I'm going to read this list of your complaints to him. And so I put the two, two together. And I say, okay, stop doing this, start doing this. And you have some power doing this. Or you get these bizarre things. You just get bizarre things you got to follow up. And it's an outlet that troops know they can go to. They mm -hmm. don't have to ask anybody's permission. I mean, but it. It spreads. You know, I married this girl in Korea, and I'm supposed to meet her at the airport, and she didn't come in. Oh, <laughs> what's this to me? <laughs> well, I don't know where she is. She and she does. I don't know where she is. But they'll come to you on this, or you get a phone call. Uh, I think someone's trying to assassinate the president. Okay. All right. But thank you for your call and your name, your phone number, and uh, if uh, I if I need any more information, how can I find you? Well, my name is so and so, and I live so and so. Okay, you drop the phone, pick up the other, dial the FBI. And say, I got a guy that says someone's going to kill the president. Information is passed. Mm -hmm. You know, you always respond to it, and that's what the IG does. He's an outlet for the for the soldiers, and he's also the commander's tool to make sure everything is going. Mm -hmm. right. 
Now, did you enjoy that duty, or did you want to move on to something else? I want to move on. It's good to help people, but... Uh, well, it wasn't intelligence work. No. Uh, I said, you know, I want to call Dr. Laura. Uh, Dr. Laura cares. But if you could, it, it's okay if you can really help somebody. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, or sometimes you really can help people. Uh, but the, the IG was set up for training, make sure the health and welfare of the service. Mm -hmm. And you have to have it, because it provides a service, it provides a good service. And it always has. Mm -hmm. But it takes a certain personality to do it. Uh, at those times when my wife, my wife has left me. And she took all the money out of the bank. And she told me, I want you to take her dependent ID card away so she can't use it. And son, there's nothing I can do for you. She she ran off with another man. She took all the money out of the bank. Son, this hurts. But I cannot help you here. I can get you alone, maybe. And I can work this through another system. I mean, emergency relief. Mm -hmm. So it's something you know, I can get you alone, or maybe a small grant, so you can buy, get, put gas in your car. But if your wife ran off and took all the money out of the bank, there's nothing I can do to help you. Those are the guys that broke my heart. Mm -hmm. They just broke my heart. So there really is nothing. It's a civilian domestic matter, mm -hmm. and I have no control over that. But not when I could help a guy like that, it was good. Then I went on to Fort McCoy, Wisconsin. And I was, this is really going to sound more bizarre. I'm not recanting anything. If you're a regular Army officer, you had to serve two years in the combat arms. Mm -hmm before you could go to your primary specialty. Mm -hmm. then, then he also wanted you to have an alternate specialty. So my alternate specialty was, I think they had me as personal administration, 41. So, so the Army at that time says, no, it's time for you to be a 41. So I went to Fort McCoy, worked in the readiness region out of Chicago, worked with the Guard and Reserve units in Wisconsin, in Iowa. Mm -hmm. It was an uneventful job. I was a 41. I was terrible at it. I had good people. I shut my mouth, drank coffee. <laughs> it, was, it was good work. I did a lot of bull hunting in Wisconsin. I shot up some deer and enjoyed the tour very much on a personal basis. Mm -hmm. But professionally, it's not my day. Then I get a phone call. I get a phone call. Says, we want you to come to Washington for an interview. I said, uh, excuse me, who am I talking to? I said, we'll let you know later on. And I said, who's paying the freight for this thing? You pay, we'll reimburse you for your ticket. I talked to my boss. So I get a phone call from somebody I don't know. And they want me to go to Washington for an interview. Who oh, are these people? I said, I'm just telling you what I was told. Because I knew this guy. He said, all right. The sound official. Yeah. So then they called me back and said, you ready? I said, yeah. This story will have a short end of the And he said, Oh, I told him I was going to fly in. I said, okay, we'll meet you at the room number, you know, the conference room there. Mm -hmm. This was in the, the Washington National Guard. And I walked in there with two guys, civilian clothes. Had an interview. We said, let's take a ride. Took a ride. At lunch, said, here's some money, cash, your plane ticket, here's some money for a cab, here's some money for a room tonight, we'll be in touch. And they dropped me off at a motel. 
So we made reservations for it. It's okay. And then we get a call back about a month later and said, uh, They said, you're going to Armed Forces Staff College next. And we'll be seeing you in 83 in June. I went to Armed Forces Staff College in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, in January of 81, I think. And after that, I went to a job in a unit that doesn't have a name and stayed there until 83. Very unusual. And we're still being closed the entire time. 83, I found that said there's an opening in Berlin for a unit commander. So I went to Berlin. Got there in June of 83. I did the same thing I did when I worked in Munich, but this time inside mm -hmm. East Germany. Uh, great city, Berlin. And I left there in 85. Now, in a general sense, uh, was it hard to get any intelligence out of East Germany? If you were very good, because you would ask me the question this way, how hard? Is it to get intelligence out there? But see, well, that's a that's a more leading question. Precisely. Yeah. Uh, well, what question is it? Is it hard to get intelligence, or how hard is it to get intelligence? Well, you can answer the, the first first. Was it hard to get intelligence out of East Germany? Um, Two part answer. Tactically, no. Internal intelligence, yes. Uh, they got, East Germans got more intelligence out of the Western, West Germany mm -hmm. than we ever got out of East Germany because their system mm -hmm. was so much more developed. And it's hard to get, and East Germany, their intelligence system, like one out of every three people was tied in. Yeah, everyone reported on everyone else. Yeah, that was yeah. But tactically, just in terms of like where the military it's, units were? It's half of Germany, mm -hmm. and there's a, you have some means of collecting the information. Mm -hmm. But you had MLM, US MLM, which is a bunch of heroes, United States military liaison mission, which gave us right up access to travel anywhere based upon the Potsdam mm -hmm. into East Germany. And those guys slept in their vehicles, by the way. And they were, they were traveling thousands of collection boxes. But they could go only in open areas because the commies would break down. They'd have PRAs, permanent restricted areas. And they're all in that. Mm -hmm. You could never go there. And we had PRAs. And then when they had our training exercise, they would put a TRA. So you can't go here now, it's temporary. Mm -hmm. and, but you go in a place else. So um, we uh, may have lost a certain amount of our, our sound here. Basically, we have been kind of tracing different stages of your career after Vietnam. You had a long stint at Fort Huachuca doing different kinds of intelligence related work. Uh, and then you've been elsewhere. So the sequence after Huachuca then was. Washington next, and oh, <coughs> right after Wachuca, I was sent to, uh, assigned to the second. I'm a captain. I'm assigned to the second Ranger Battalion, okay. Fort Lewis, Washington. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So you you work with the second with with the Rangers, and you go from the Rangers then to the Inspector General's office in Washington, uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. Oh, but same place. So you okay? So you're geographically there. the same place. Okay. Not not to D.C. Okay. Let's clarify that that. Way. Okay, so you're still based in that area, so you're now attending to complaints and concerns of soldiers as well as doing inspections of units and, and so forth through Correct. there. Uh, and then you are doing this for a certain 
I'm doing this for a period of time until they tell me I have to go to my alternate specialty, right. which at that time, each officer had to have two specialties and serve a tour in the alternate specialty. And they said, hey, it's alternate specialty time, and you're going to the readiness group McCoy, Fort McCoy, Wisconsin. And I said, that's cool, because that's kind of close to Michigan, and the weather's somewhat the same. Mm -hmm. It always rains in Washington. Don't believe what they tell you. It rains all the time there. So I go to Fort McCoy, Wisconsin. Great time. And if, you know, it really was. A, I like Wisconsin. Uh, and then I get a magic phone call. You want me to tell you about the magic phone yeah, call? Yeah, let's pick up the story with a magic phone call, yeah. I get a phone call, and the guy says, You're gonna, I want you to come to Washington and, uh, for an interview. I said, who are you? I said, well, it's, not, it's not important who we are. And he says, well, how do I contact you? And I said, well, I, hot, what I, I have to tell my boss something. And by the way, I'm a major now. I got promoted. And he said, tell your boss that this is an official request, but we're not going to go into it. Tell my boss, he can't quite figure this out, but I have a good relationship with him. He said, this sounds spooky to me. He said, but if you think, you know, go ahead and I'll, I'll let you go. The guy calls me back and said, I tell him what? He said, okay, good. He said, I'll call you back a couple of days. Tell me when you're coming in. He calls back. He says, when you landed Washington National at the time, go to conference room, meeting room 224A and knock on the door, which I did because I'm a good boy, I do what I'm told. Meet two guys, they interview me, talk, talk a little smack, chit-chat. They're in civilian clothes, they said, oh, get in the car. They drive me around, we have lunch. And they said, here's your, mot here's your hotel, motel, whatever they put me in. Uh, he said, the guy walk, opens up his pocket, peels me out, this is for your airfare, this is for your hotel. This is for your taxi. Thank you for your interest in national security. We'll be in touch. That was that kind of bizarre, man. Mm -hmm. uh, I get a phone call about 30 days later. I said, well, this is what's going to happen to you? You, you? You're going to Armed Forces Staff College. You'll be in Norfolk for, I think it's four or five months. And we'll be seeing you later on. I come one day, my, my master's tell me you're going to Armed Forces Staff College in January of 83. And off I went. And after that, I get another phone call and I'm a student say, you're, going up, you're coming up to Washington. I come up there, I, I have no place to stay. So I stay with a guy who took over from me from my Ranger Battalion mm -hmm. days. We stay in touch. So I'm living with him and his two daughters and his dog and two cats <laughs> in the basement because his wife ran off on him and left him with his two daughters. So I'm living with him and I'm, the guy picks me up who lived in the area, took me to work, that was it. I stayed with him for probably six weeks because at this time they said you're going to Lebanon they said I still I still got a passport mm -hmm. red official passport to Lebanon and this is the time when Lebanon's going mm -hmm. kind of crazy this is 83 mm -hmm. remember and but they said, <coughs> they said we're gonna we're, we're waiting to get you in but before we send you to Lebanon we want you to go to French language school. And I said, language school? Okay. Remembering my eight mm -hmm. score on my language aptitude test. So they sent me to Berlitz. I go to school every day at Berlitz. Then I go to work. I didn't go down well at all. I don't like the Berlitz. Remember I told you how to memorize German yep. language? Yep. You don't memorize Berlitz. 
It's modeling. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't model what I can't see. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to, you, you know, I find it very difficult. I'm supposed to remember what I hear. You can't recall words you hear. You can't listen to them and visualize them. But anyway, <coughs> I'm supposed to go, and then I'm not supposed to go, and then we can get you in. Because bloody Hezbollah kept mucking up, you know, the airport. Mm -hmm. And as long as they kept screwing around with the airport, planes wouldn't land. And then they would, planes would land. Well, I'm, I don't know if I'm supposed to go to Beirut and do my job or I'm supposed to wait and get an apartment because no sense mm -hmm. in getting an apartment if I'm not going to be living in it. So I stay with Rex. Mm -hmm. Finally, I get a, a message back from the two change. It came from the J-2, which is a C, Joint Command, mm -hmm. J-2 Intelligence Officer saying, you know, we appreciate Major Bassett's willingness to mm -hmm. serve. But this is getting ridiculous for him and everybody else. We're canceling this particular project. Mm -hmm. So they cancel it. So I stayed with this unit till uh, 80, oh, what am I? I get my years screwed up. Yeah, well, yeah this is 81, mm -hmm. 81 to 83. Okay. And then I know there's an uh, opportunity for a command assignment in Berlin. Mm -hmm. So I take it. I'm chosen for it. So I go to Berlin. Everybody goes to Berlin. Okay. And I what do was, what I did yeah. in Munich. Okay. So you're still dealing with sort of human intelligence and, and so forth? So forth, yes. Okay. Uh, now, what were the maybe basic kinds of challenges in terms of trying to gather intelligence out of East Germany? Uh, I never tried. Okay. Um, During that time, intelligence was gained from people, and intelligence was gained, in, as it always has been, from human sources, mm -hmm. meaning people came across the line, right. legal immigrants. Everybody gets debriefed mm -hmm. what they have to offer. Sometimes the East Germans with the Russian vacuum would send in sleepers. Yep. People want to know what, you, what you're interested in. That's mm -hmm. a catch point in intelligence. What you're asking them all the time, if it's on technology, is things that you don't know. Well, you send in a, you know, a plant. And what he wants to know is, what do you want to know? Mm -hmm. Because what you want to know is you don't have, so now I know what I am on mm -hmm. this. And sometimes they would send people over uh, from the PAC countries, Poland, Czechoslovakia, you know, say, I want a defector, I want, mm -hmm. a, I want a spy for you. But they go through, the, some of these are all, you know, they're plants, so mm -hmm. they go through a screening process, but these people would be debriefed or uh, sometimes they would be sent back and, you know, come. I would never talk to them. Come back when you got something to offer or mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't really trust you. And then people would come back, would uh, get out through other countries, uh, like on tours. Now, this had nothing to do with me. I'm in mm -hmm. Berlin. So that's how you're getting out information mm -hmm. uh, from people like that. You get it through technical means. You get it from things that are in the air. Communications right. are in the air. You can't, you know, you can decode them or you can receive them. It doesn't mean you can decode them. But people make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Take, make mistakes. You would get it from aerial overflights. You could fly around Berlin on the western side, but you can see a long ways this way. Mm -hmm. And you have radars and you have infrared, stuff like this you could pick up. And you can also get a telephonic. If you get up high enough with the right optics, you can see a long ways. And, you and of course, you get it from satellites. Satellites can do mm -hmm. it. You, know, you can't hide a lot of stuff there. That's external. That's, you know, the East German Army and the Russian Army. Mm -hmm. Where are they? Because we know where their barracks are. Mm -hmm. And it, we were always looking about an armor threat. Well, if the tanks are in the tank park, they're not in the mm -hmm. field. Because they get, if they're out of the tank park, where are they? That's all you want to know. Mm -hmm. If they're in the field, that's fine. But tanks don't roll clear across to an attack position. They're generally trucked. You put them on a truck and you move them into an attack position. So we generally had an idea where it was. Internal intelligence, which is generally of civilian interest for policy makers mm -hmm. and CIA and counterintelligence interest, that's a little more difficult. Mm -hmm. I was more interested in the military side right. of it. 
Okay. But you would also send American personnel into East Germany? No. Following, so according to the Potsdam Rules, Americans. Oh, okay, okay. Not, not, they're no, doing nothing secret, but okay. they are just going. <coughs> the Potsdam Agreement allowed <coughs> the breaking up of Germany into sections. Before the war was over, it was broken up into sections. And because Berlin was the capital, Berlin was broken down into sections because it happened to be in East Germany. And Berlin happens to be some 80 miles from Poland, which politicians sometimes don't even know because I think I sat with a congressman one time in Berlin, and he thought he was on the East German, West German border. Mm -hmm. He didn't know he was 80 miles from Poland. But that, yeah, the, as it may, everyone had a sector that, that they occupied. We were an occupying force in Germany, and we were an occupying force in Berlin, because Berlin was the capital. So it was a microcosm mm -hmm. of Germany. Mm -hmm. All of East Germany was hacked off to the Russians. So Berlin was broken down little pieces. Now, every country, France, Germany, America, and England, had a cut in this pie, and every country had the right to send in their people to another person's section. But man, we just cared about the Russian section. Mm -hmm. And that was a military liaison mission. And they had the right to go anytime they wanted to, without coordination, to drive about as a check and balance. The Russians would put, and we would put, permanent restricted areas where we didn't want these guys. And if they had a special training mission, they slap up a sign and said, okay, you guys can't come in these areas. Temporarily restricted, but you can go anyplace else. Well, these guys, generally two of them, would take off in specially modified vehicles, and they traveled to the very edges, and they had all kinds of devices in them. And the vehicles were configured to look differently at daytime and nighttime, especially light displays. You want to be a motorcycle, you're a motorcycle. You want no lights, you got no lights. You can do all kinds of things. But they were always followed by the East Germans. Mm -hmm. Now, the Germans, but all East Germans and the Russians always put these signs, you know, these temporary restricted areas. They may move about five miles. Well, these guys would say, and this is not on the map, it's a very close call here. And they would move, and they would go in, and sometimes these people look at you cross into a temporary restricted area, mm -hmm. and then they could hold them. Now, on January, June 1st, 1983, they killed one of these guys. You remember? Nope. They killed one, the Russians did. Uh, they shot him because the Russians had a train load of tanks. And these guys got out. And because where the trains were parked was in, neither was an open area. Mm -hmm. Railroad tracks aren't. So these guys had a right to do what they're going to do. So they would go into these tanks to see if they get manual, see what's on inside. In Berlin, there was a spy. And he was later caught. And he was, he worked for the Russians. Because he would have knowledge in Berlin intelligence community where we were going to send these guys. Because the guy, head intelligence guy, the deputy chief of staff for intelligence for Berlin, would send this team out, mm -hmm. and they would also get some other missions. And they would tell, go into this area and see what you got, see what the Russians are doing. Frankly, we knew what they were, but different types of equipment mm -hmm. was always interesting. So he told his Russians that these guys were going to be here. And things went very bad after that. And they shot them and killed them. And they wouldn't let them give them any, as I understand, any medical support. And then the head of the military liaison mission, Colonel Roland LeJoy, he himself went out in a vehicle to the back to the area as a 
is a is a physical protest. Mm -hmm. Or look at, I know what you did. Now, you try this with me. And they banged this car. Sometimes the Russians would take one of these cars and they they get them on get one on the road, get behind them, and put another truck up there so they can't pass them and box them in. It's a dirty business, see. Mm -hmm. And that's why people do get into this lifestyle, because it's happening now. Mm -hmm. You're also part of history now. And you're involved in what is going on as opposed to being involved in a, you know, a regular normal lifestyle, which, a lot of, which we need people in normal lifestyle, because they, they support people like us. And we support people like them by our lifestyle, mm -hmm. but there's, it's just a miles apart in, in yeah. difference. Now, how long did you stay in Berlin this time? Three years. Okay, uh, which ended when? 85. Okay, now at that point... Uh, or 86. No, Scott, I am really screwed up here. 85 to 88. Okay. That, now I was in the other unit, like 81 to 83. Okay, so... Now, in this period, can you start to sense that things are being beginning to fall apart on the other side? In Berlin? In East Germany? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it was an evangelical movement. It was run of the Protestant churches. Um, a number of things were kicking off in there. Uh, food rationing, pollution. I think they had some uh, diseases. Go hoof and mouth disease was going on. Uh, and people were just tired. Were people aware also what was going on over in Poland? Because the Solidarity Movement in that period. I would, uh, only if the West told them. Okay. They had one radio channel. They weren't. We could broadcast. Mm -hmm. Americans would broadcast radio. Yeah, American radio signals, and and the British would broadcast. BF, BS British forces broadcasting mm. stations or whatever mm -hmm. systems. Americans at AFN, terrible to listen to, but served a purpose. But I guess you could pump up the voltage in the TV too, and they could get that in, in parts of East Germany. Nope. They certainly could get the radio. Would they the certainly could get it inside would, of East Germany. Would the Soviets or East Germans try to jam those signals? Uh, they would make it. They would, no, they couldn't jam them because they would jam everything. Mm. Because if you're in Berlin, you jam that, yeah. it's going to come back on you. But they would, you know, they, you know, I heard that one of the little spies are spying on each other. If you're in a foreign country, if you're in your home country, mm -hmm. you're in Walmart, and somebody walks by speaking German, your ears will light up in a heartbeat. If you're in Germany and you're listening to a radio broadcast and you hear English or Western music, mm -hmm. not that they're Eastern country, you, you know, you'd have to sit there with the earphones on and listen. And I'm sure we also had Radio Liberty then, was still in action, that was directed at agency was directed at Russia, mm -hmm. and Radio for Europe was still broadcasting back mm -hmm. then. So they could pick that information up that way. But there were, it was it just started as a groundswell under uh, Eric Honecker, mm -hmm. I think was still in, yeah. in power then. Now, were there people by 88 trying to get, a, get over the wall and that kind of thing, or um, was that not really well, good? You, you had Reagan coming in and giving a speech. Yep. I was there at the time, thank you very much. Um, n nobody got over that wall that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, people, you had German guards shoot to kill. You had lights. You had mine zone. Mm -hmm. You had wire. You had dead zones. And you, you'd have to go through all that. That was the hardest way to get across. Mm -hmm. Early on. People did try. Yeah. The wall went up. First it was wire, then it was a wall. But as it became more elaborate and mm -hmm. complex, then it was a wall, wire, standoff, sand, wire, guard towers, dogs, mm -hmm. guard dogs on leashes, on wires, with the leash on it, go patrolling back and forth. And then you would have guards moving back and forth. 
It was just too hard to yeah. do. Uh, were there ways to get into West Berlin from the east? Yes. I've heard. Uh, there were supposedly openings in the walls mm -hmm. for East German agents to come through. But in, as far as getting into Berlin, there was the subway. Mm -hmm. The subway system ran from East Germany through West Germany, East Berlin mm -hmm. to West Berlin to East Berlin. You could go. Now, any, there were no guards that I can recall on West Berlin side of the subway. If an East German got on the subway, he could get off in West Berlin. If a West German or an American got on the subway, they would tell you this is the last stop. Mm -hmm. But no one, the train kept on going. If you came up to the stairwell, you'd be met by East German Zollpolizei. Mm -hmm. uh, but any, anybody else, so kind of the theory was if the, when the East Germans or Russians wanted to know what was going on in West Berlin, they just get on the subway mm -hmm. or the underground or the U-Bahn and they'd get up and get off and then kind of way back, come back and sh show his party pass and mm -hmm. walk away. It was pretty simple to do. But did they try to, didn't they try to keep anybody from taking the subway into West Berlin, though? There would, uh, no doubt they would stop people from on their side, but I don't have no knowledge of that because I never took the subway. Okay. We were always scared to death. Now, I know of people who've been, you know, smoking and joking and missed that sign, last stop before East Berlin, but made the circuit all the way through. Mm -hmm. As long as they stayed on the train, they were okay. Because you could, you could, if you had the paperwork, the permission to travel to East Berlin, mm -hmm. You could use that as a legal means. Most people that travel legally, wives could go, kids could go, military could go. With you just took, mm -hmm. you had to be in uniform, had the right paperwork. You don't respond to or answer any questions given to you by the East Germans because they're an occupied state. Mm -hmm. They had no authority. You should just show them your your pass, which would be actually was a big piece of paper. And you'd go, you could go through and get off and just say, here I am. Because you had access to all of East Berlin. Mm -hmm. Most people saw that much of East right. Berlin. People in the business made it, or made it their point to visit all parts of East Berlin, as far as they could go to the border of East Berlin and East Germany. They'd go on out there. Right. Then when I was also happened to be there because my next job took me, you want me to move on? Sure. My next job took me to another command at Fort Meade, Maryland. And we were concerned. We, we, had, we had the, the right to, uh, if immigrants came to the United States, and if they would agree, we could talk, we could talk to them about anything mm -hmm. that may be of interest to us. But if they didn't agree, you didn't have to talk to you. It's our law. Mm -hmm. you, if you're dealing with anything intelligence purpose with a U.S. citizen, you cannot use a subterfuge. You have to tell them exactly up front who you mm -hmm. are. And that is also true if you're in this country. If you're just passing through, you cannot fool people. That's the last time I knew the law. Uh, but we could, we'd, we'd find some interesting people. Mm -hmm. But we would do Russians and some people coming out of Cuba. Or, and I had four or five offices around the countryside that would make these appointments. And we generally knew who they were. There, that was a big immigrant thing with the Soviets coming. Mm -hmm. And Armenians, too. Soviet mm -hmm. Jews, mainly, getting to this country. And the laws of this country, other than in the, in the Russian Jews, they had a they automatically got in. Mm -hmm. But any other nationality, you could go from your point of departure to the U.S. without a stop in between. Meaning, 
You could go from Cuba to the U.S., you'd be okay. Mm -hmm. You went to Cuba, Panama, you're not okay. And you're a legal immigrant if you could go back, if sending you back to your home country would cause you harm mm -hmm. or religious prosecution. But you cannot come out of any country. You cannot come out of a, uh, a democratic country without a, with a, no history of persecution mm -hmm. and saying, I'm, they don't like me in my country, so I'm coming to your country. Uh, during what time span did you have this job? Was this 88? Yeah, I'm 88, 89. Mm -hmm. And this is right around the same time where the Eastern Bloc is starting to fall apart. Yeah. So now you're getting a lot of people starting to come out of those yeah. places. So yeah, yeah. Interesting time to be in that business then. Yeah, we're, um, we're picking up Czechs coming out of the uh, Czech Republic mm -hmm. into Austria. Um, they started to flood the system. They, they, I think some of these guys were moving within the block, and I think they were trying to get into Vienna. Uh, I think that's the, one of the routes they were taking. Mm -hmm. But they, they got to be screened. Uh, but f at that time, we were pretty peculiar, particular who, you, who, who we mm -hmm. let in. You have to have some control over right. who you're getting into your country, as you're going to lose your country. All right. Uh, now, so you only did this for about a year or so? Yeah, I was lieutenant colonel, then, then they promoted me. Uh, and they sent me up to the Army staff in the Pentagon. But they didn't totally promote you. That's called the frocking. When they, if you are on the list to be promoted, mm -hmm. but they want you in positional, posi positional power, they'll just, they'll make you a colonel, but they'll pay you as lieutenant colonel. Mm -hmm. And they cannot pay you as lieutenant colonel until you've been signed off by Congress. Congress will sign off on the list. And that makes it official. And then you're given a number. And the number uh, is your promotional number. Mm -hmm. The ones with the most time and grade, you're like your number, you're one. So when they assess you on, because they can only have so much in the standing army. We'll take the f top 10 this month. Okay, one through 10 gets on. Mm -hmm. So now 11, is, you still, you know, we're now we do 11 to 12. And if your number is 135, okay, get yourself a sandwich, a cup of coffee, because <laughs> it's going to be about a year and a half before we get around to promoting it. All right. Now, what kind of work did you do then at this next level? I was in charge, uh, I had a division. That means nothing to the listener. Mm -hmm. The Pentagon is broken down into sections. Army, Navy, Air Force, and our Army, Navy, Air Force. I'm missing. Well, I don't know. Does the Coast Guard count? No. Yeah. Uh, it counts. And joint. Okay. Joint. JCS, joint staff. Army section is operations, logistics, within each one of those sections. Mm -hmm. That's the J, that'd be the Army, right now they call it the G2 or intelligence, the G4, G1 for uh, personnel manners. They change the term sometimes. Okay, you have um, directorates. Directorates for ma three major things in intelligence. Signals intelligence, Human intelligence, uh, imagery intelligence. So you would have policy and operations for POI, policy operations, imagery, policy operations, signals. I was in policy operations unit. Anything to do with people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had a division. That was my division. Because all three of those divisions, human imagery and signal all mm -hmm. came out of the one director in chief. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did for a living. Okay. Now, were you responsible for the whole globe or do they divide you up by no. region or? No, the globe. But see, this is this what you're getting, you're not operational. You're getting into budgeting, mm -hmm. equipment budgeting, okay. resources, manpower. You have different types of uh, 
you have different types of staff, different mm -hmm. types of money. Uh, the Army is one big, you know, all, you got all these slots, but it's all divided up, and you have different funds to support different products and different, different manpower, different rosters to support different types of occupations. So what you were doing there was largely bureaucratic, that you're managing stuff? Not largely bureaucratic, totally bureaucratic. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was it. And then Iraq invaded Kuwait. And I said, I have to get a five o'clock. I got to get on a train at 5.30 in the morning in Maryland, change trains at Union Station, change stations from the red line to the yellow line, and get off at the Pentagon, I believe. And then I get home at 7.30, 8 o'clock at night, and Iraq invaded Kuwait. We're going to go to war. I said, send me. I'm getting out of this place. Better hours, better food. I'll go to war. And he said, no, you're staying here. Shut up and get back to your house. <laughs> I'll tell you when you're going. And then before the war kicked off, then I get a phone call and General Stewart wants you. And I said, hot oh, darn, I'm getting out of this place. And I was happy. I hated the Pentagon. But, I mean, I'm, I got to get up at 4.30, catch a 5.30 train. I'm going to get mm -hmm. home to 7.30. Some people love it. But they live close by. Yeah. They love it. I'm, I didn't. So I go over there. I do my business. The war is over. I do some business. I do some uh, counterintelligence work. I, I got all these, uh, talk to some of these uh, Iraqi POWs, we got people doing that. I'm coordinating with the uh, Saudis. I'm coordinating with the Saudi Army, slash, Saudi Arabian National Guard, the Sang people. Uh, and I fly home. This is bizarre, you know, this is a bizarre world we live in. Mm -hmm. You know, they said, okay, we're done with you. Go fly home. Okay, what, when you, I said, uh, when, do, when do I go? Said, we'll get you in a four o'clock afternoon flight. You travel light, you don't take civilian clothes. You travel light, carry a shot record, ID, you know, everything else provided for you. I go out the plane, I go out to the airport, guy drives me out, they manifest you, I'm on a flight, I'm wearing the same clothes I went to work in the morning. Mm -hmm. I got a little ditty bag, I fly to some island off in Sicily. I fly to some place in Ireland, Shannon. Mm -hmm. It's a military aircraft, I yep. know. Yeah. I fly into uh, Bangor, Maine. It's 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. We debark in Bangor, Maine. Have I gone through this before? No. no. This is a good people, Maine. It's like 11, between 11 and 1. These people in Bangor are going out to the airport because this is a traditional route we're coming back on. Long, the corridor, you get off the plane, down a long corridor, it ramps down. I've got men, women, and children. See? This is right after Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. And they're saying thank you. They're saying thank you. A little different from the guy with the VC flag. Yeah, you, oh, brother, right on. I kissed every lady, shook every man's hand, and said thank you. All the way down the line. I didn't miss one of them. And way at the bottom, you know, they, just, they got a little coffee and cake and stuff, and you just want to get off that plane. Mm -hmm. Did you, you didn't, we never got off the plane in these other places. And you got some guys from Vietnam there, you know. You got these old soldiers again. The blue heads, and and they're there, and they, they want to talk to soldiers because they miss it. Mm -hmm. They miss part of that life, which they you know they, maybe they didn't like at the time, 
these guys are all there. So they, I found out every plane that comes in, those people from Bangor, Maine, are there. And I thanked them to this day. It literally make me want to cry because I was very proud of them. And I thought that was so kind of them to do that. Now, when you got back now, did they make you go back to the same job you had before you left? Now, this, this is bizarre. Well, they, when, I, when they <laughs> finish this story, you know how time is compressed. <clears throat> then they fly you, next stop is Norfolk, Virginia. Mm -hmm. They're flying to Norfolk, the naval base there. Yep. And they say, you're home. Where do you want to go? I said, well, how do I get back to Maryland? I said, well, you look, and he said, there's a bus that's going out to the airport. I said, oh, no, not a bus. <laughs> I, go to the, I go to the economy rental car. I get in the car, I drive home. And I'm still, I'm still in the same fatigues. Then I left Saudi, I left Kuwait in. Mm -hmm. Whether I'm Saudi or I was in Kuwait, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I stop at a Hardee's, I get myself a coffee, something, some breakfast food, you know. And it's so strange that as you, I'm, I need a shave by now. I mean at Hardee's. About 12 hours later, I was still on the staff, just bang, bang. Because they're trying to move people out as fast as possible. Give credit to this guy, General Bogonis. Ended up working for Sears when he retired. They wanted to get the troops home as fast as they could. But the logisticians, the brilliant people who had to get all this stuff from Europe and the States over to start this war, mm -hmm. are stuck there because they got to get all this stuff back. Everything's got to be clean, wash, go through customs. And they bring customs over, make sure that nothing that's transported back into the U.S. or into Europe can bring any virus or vector or whatever happens. So these guys are still over there. And we're bringing back all this ash and trash that we, you know, there are other people over there collecting documents and ammunitions and weapons and took a lot of stuff, C5A full out of there, but well, they're probably still going through all those documents. But then I, then I got home and I called my boss and said, yo, I'm back. Yeah, I'm great. So I'm coming back to work. And off I went. And I went to Saudi based on a phone call. Because I worked at night. I worked at Saturday because I worked at, you know, fairly. Everything is a linear priority of once. I worked in that Saturday in the Pentagon. I came home. My wife said, call your boss. I called my boss. He said, when you come to work Monday, be prepared to go to Saudi Arabia. You're going. And I said, OK. He said, bring your shot record. Make sure you got your dog tags. Yeah, I know. You don't need to bring much. Bang. There it goes. There you go. All right. Now you've come back. You've gone back to work in, in the same job. And then yep. how long do you stay in that? Till I crank up another reason to leave. I came up with an idea of taking, and this was going on. This is this is the peace dividend. And the peace dividend, everybody said, okay, uh, we're all going to be rich. No more DOD. Uh, we'll have no more wars. Mm -hmm. Peace and love. Flour for everyone, and have a coke. And in the meantime, we're going to downsize everything. And they did. They downsized a lot. And my job was how to downsize some issues, some aspects of the intelligence community. And I came up with a, an idea to, to reform a structure. And I held a worldwide conference and brought people all in from all over the world and told them, we're going, this is how we're going to do it. And People said, oh, no, you're not. This is our stuff. And, you know, typical how things go. We did it. Bottom line, we did it. And then the general said, okay, well, what do we go from next? Well, you make me the commander, and I'll put this thing into effect. And he said, okay. And they sent me to Fort Meade, and they, get some, they put some good people, and I created a division, some degree of energy, and the reason vision is important, people got to know where they're going. Mm -hmm. and they have a clear concept. They may be dead wrong, 
but they have to have a concept of where all this is going. And I remember one speech, I brought everyone together, just on the staff, maybe at 50 people. And I said this, pay attention to how we're going to get there. Because one day you're going to wake up and this is all going to be done. Because we had to reorganize the world. And one day it was done. And I held that job for two years. Are we still on, by the way? Yeah. And then I, I got out of that job. They sent me to DEIA, Defense Intelligence Agency. And they were going to restructure a few things. So they made me chief of the operational group. I had some civilians from state, about three guys from the CIA, some of my people and DIA people. And what was really happening is DIA didn't like what I did for the Army because mm -hmm. they wanted to take it all over. And I'll, th then their move was to take it all over. That's my parochial point of view. And then I said, no, I've got to give away something I worked so hard to and my people, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm, I'm not real bright and my span of attention sometimes get lost. So I have to rely on people to do their job so I can think ahead. I don't want to get too much in the weeds. And the best people I have, I say, get it done so I don't have to worry about it. And they do it. And these guys do their job. They do their job. You I mean, read it. That's great. Civilians, military, all the same. Doesn't matter. They put me on the staff to do it up at DIA. And I did it. And I came up with a plan. But what am I doing? I'm back taking a train again to work. Mm -hmm. I'm driving to this train to the metro. And there's another command job opening up at Fort Meade. So I said, I'll take that job. And I did. And what was it? I was the commander of the Central Clearance Facility at Fort Meade, Maryland. And that was at that time, it still exists. We valid, we granted, validated, updated, rescinded, denied, discontinued all security clearances for all Department of the Army, Reserve, and active duty soldiers and civilians. Starting with the process of to get a clearance is a long drawn out process. It became worse as the Walker case and stuff like mm -hmm. this started hit the, hit the fan because it requires. Military starting to build up. If you have to get a clearance, you, every officer must be a bit must be clearable to secret. Every enlisted man must be clearable for secret. But that means they got to get a whole series of background checks. Mm -hmm. And then once the CI guy does all these checks, which is you know your money, your police, your morals, your reputation, all this other stuff. Then it goes into us, it's a package, and it goes to our adjudicators, and the adjudicator will look at the package. If it's a complete package, she'll make a decision, or he'll make a decision. If it's not a complete package that they're comfortable with, because they're the ones that grant the clearance, that adjudicator, they will send it back and say, I need more information on this. And then, okay, you're in the back of the line now. So it could take six months, in some cases up to a year. And when it really got bad, it could take, you know, a year and a half because more people are coming in and finances and stuff like this. Um, and I ran that for a while. And then I got a job in Michigan with the National Guard. It was going to be my retirement job. Mm -hmm. And then I got prostate cancer. And that started, uh, I got that in 96. And then they took that little rascal clean out of me while I was sleeping. And <laughs> that was a joke, it was a pretty good one too. Uh, they took that thing out and then I was in, uh, I was in from 96 to 97, I was in a twilight zone. Uh, because the Army couldn't do anything with me because mm -hmm. I was recuperating. 
they couldn't discharge me because they didn't know if I was, because they had to wait six months. So I'm non-functioning for six months. I'm taken from a regular status into, I'm actually transferred to a hospital status in Fort mm -hmm. Knox. And then I go to a disability board and he said, we're going to medically retire you. So they did. They medically retired me in July of 97. But I had a, a July, no, July of 97, they medically retired me. I had a mandatory retirement date of November 97. Mm -hmm. So it worked out rather nicely. Then I took out a short time for a civilian job. Then in 99, I went to Columbia. I got a, con a contractor's job because the Congress and the President were pushing for an operation called Plan Columbia, which we would assist the Colombian Armed Forces, the Defense Ministry, mm -hmm. and the civilian arm. Well, not this. I better watch my terms here. The Colombian National Police, which is different than the Colombian military. Mm -hmm. It's kind of under, the, excuse me, under the ministry, excuse me, under the Ministry of Defense, but they're totally separate. Mm -hmm. But they're in competition for re resources and funds, and they have different uh, perspectives. The Colombian National Police are supported by the DEA. They do all the raids. The Colombian National Police are in the cities, in the villages out there in the outback. The ministry, the Army, Navy, Air Force of the Colombian military is supposed to fight the, the land war against all these yes, guerrillas and guerrilla groups. Yeah. And the plan was to move equipment and, and support into Colombia to help synchronize and modernize and for what they would need to do this a better mm -hmm. job. Now, Colombia has got about 19 different subversive groups in it. And they all want the same thing. They want land, land to grow cocaine, coca mm -hmm. plants on, which you can get about three crops a year. And the more land, the more coca, the more money, the more money, the more arms I can buy, the richer I become. I can get my finca or farm out here. And actually, pretty soon, you're revolutionaries. You're all a bunch of criminals. You're no revolutionary zeal, man in the moon, but you're just what you do for a living. Mm -hmm. So you had the FARC and the AUC and I think it was L-19 and this liberation front and that liberation front. And they're all fighting amongst themselves for land, the FARC being the biggest donor because mm -hmm. that was the um, communist front from mm -hmm. 1948. So I came down there with about a 12-man team and we did a survey. I had the intelligence piece. And our job was to suggest what they needed to do. And so we did personnel section, the logistical section, the operational section, and the intelligence section, and then the interface. And then that was for Plan Columbia. That was in 99, in an apartment, I lived by myself. And I came out of there in uh, March of 2001. Now, do you think you accomplished anything in that time? I mean, did the Colombians actually act on recommendations and do things that were useful? That's an interesting. <coughs> there, there are two points. Yes and no. Uh, yes, because we gave them ideas. My intelligence section came darn close to pulling it off. Uh, but you see, cooperation with us was was uh, considered necessary for the dollars to follow. Mm -hmm. We would tell them on the operational side, logistical side, how to prepare for an infusion of more modernized equipment. But that, we'll give you money to buy it, but this is what you're going to buy. Mm -hmm. The swift boats to go against drug boats, better intelligence systems. Mm -hmm. My particular job was to synthesize and coordinate how the intelligence was moving back and forth because everything was quite parochial. Nothing was shared between the Ministry of Defense and the National Police. Mm -hmm. And there were some animosities. And the National Police were being kicked around. 
because all these raids when these guerrilla groups would come in, they were going after the national police. And there may be three, four guys with their wives and kids living in the police station. Mm -hmm. They kill them all. See, these liberation people, they just go in and kill them all. Mm -hmm. And then the military was there to bail these guys out with their military bases, and sometimes they didn't show up uh, fast enough, and there was, there was some animosity. And the point I tried to make to them is, because I would have meetings with them once a week, all the representatives, it's the same flag that covers every one of these coffins. Mm -hmm. Amigos, they're not any different. It's the Colombian national flag. And I like Colombians. Uh, they've got great weather. It's a beautiful country. And they've got beautiful women. Sun's up at 6 in the morning. It's down at 6 every evening, <laughs> right on time. Um, it's a great country. And they're really good people. And there's heroes that live there. But they're under a lot of pressure. All right. Now, you get back in 2001. And so you come back. Uh, now, is your contractor job up at that point? Or? No, that contract's over. I get back. I'm back for two weeks. I, I'm underneath my lawn tractor, greasing it. My wife said, here's a phone. And I said, oh. I said, hey, what are you doing? So I'm underneath my tractor trying to get the zerts greased. I said, I don't need you in Washington in two days. I said, come on, Bill, I just got back. It's only three, no more than five. I said, okay. And so I get there, and he said, this is quite starting to kick off now. now where am I now? Oh, this is, uh, which war am I in now? Well, this is Bush going into Iraq. Yeah, well, Afghanistan first. But that's, you get 9-11. Nothing to do with Afghanistan. I got Bush, this is, this right. is tied in with Bush. Okay, but all right, but basically, in terms of the time frame, if you come back from Colombia early in 2001,